Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. So tonight, just for a few minutes, I, uh, I want to talk to you about, uh, well, you'll see in a minute. Okay, let's, let me, so who knows what this is? What is it? Can we get that on? Cameraman? Can you get that on? Who knows what that is? A corkscrew. Okay. Now, there's something very interesting about a corkscrew is they're extremely strong. And uh, um, Solomon, writing in the book of Ecclesiastes, made a statement that... that um, that uh, Peterson, in his message translation, used a particular phrase because the phrase that was in, in, the, in the Hebrew talks about what's twisted. So Peterson, bringing it up to date, used this phrase, and it's in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 15. It says, life's a corkscrew that cannot be straightened. Now, you would have to admit that it's also a tool... Well, let me say first of all about the guy who wrote this. It wasn't one of his best days. Ecclesiastes is not good after dinner reading. Um, he, he's, not, he's not totally on top of his game. He's a bit miffed at life. Um, but within there, he makes some incredible statements about life. And this is one of them, that life is like a corkscrew that cannot be straightened. Now, here's the problem. Life is like a corkscrew that can't be straightened, but too many of us spend far too much time trying to straighten out what can't be straightened. And so you waste energy and time and emotional effort and, and sometimes partially destroy your faith in God because you're trying to straighten things out that you can't straighten out because you weren't meant to straighten them out. It's not your business to straighten them out. But there are a couple of interesting things about the, about the corkscrew. Number one is, what do you do with a corkscrew? What's, what's the main function of a corkscrew? To do, to, put, to do what? What does a corkscrew do? It, so it pulls the cork out of a bottle. What's normally the bottle that has the cork in that you remove with the corkscrew? How many of you know what the Bible says about wine? Wine is always symbolic of joy of life, because it's a fermented product, it's something that's on the move, it's something that's grown, it's something that has become something else. It used to be a grape on a bush, and now it's become something that has life within it, that has movement, that has the power to change how you think and how you behave. Now, I am not an advocate of drunkenness, the Bible says plenty about drunkenness, but it also says that wine makes glad the heart of a man, and there is some symbolism here. That if you learn how to negotiate correctly this corkscrew called life, it will pull the bottle, it will pull the cork out of the bottle, and it will give you access to the wine, which is the life that Jesus was talking about. I've come that you might have life. But that doesn't come because we are translated out of this life. It comes because of in this life, by the grace of God, and with the gift of God, and understanding that Christ in us is the hope of glory, we learn how to use this thing called life to extract what it is that God has for us that's his best on our behalf. So it's the tool that opens the bottle. Now, there's one, one other little lesson on this, and it's what I call the helix. Some of you know what a helix is. A helix is a series of circles, but they are concentric. They don't, they don't pass into themselves. They make the screw like that. So that's a series of circles. Yeah, it's a series of circles, but what happens as you, as you journey on these circles, yes, you're going to come round near the same place, you're going to visit some of the same feelings and experiences, but the truth is, nothing's ever the same. You're either going up the helix, or you're going down the helix, but you can't get off the helix, because you can't straighten a corkscrew. Life is like a helix. Now, here's what's fascinating to me. Isn't it interesting how much within the context of science and biology operates in the realm of helix. If you ever see an oscilloscope, 
which is for measuring electrical current, you will see it doing this. But if you saw it three-dimensional, you see it's actually doing this. It's a corkscrew. What is DNA, the very essence of human life? It's a helix. Because life is built on a helix. You can't straighten the corkscrew. But you can decide whether you are going up the helix or down the helix. And here's what Paul said about it. He said, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes me free from the law of sin and death. So there's something about this law that is called the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that I'm trying to encourage you into that makes you go up the helix. You're going round in circles, but they're not set circles. They're part of a helix. And you can rise that helix by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But if you insist on living in what Paul calls the law of sin and death, then you keep going down the helix. You have a power in you, given by God, if you will submit to the purposes of God within you to go up the helix and keep going up the helix. Because life is a corkscrew that can't be straightened but you can use it to open life. To turn water to wine. To find what it is that you need. Okay? So, the power to ascend. Now, there's a statement that was made by the late, great Brendan Manning, who is a man I greatly admire, and if some of you haven't read his books, I would recommend that you uh, have a read of Brennan's books. They're very different. They're very con contemplative. Uh, but deeply spiritual and deeply helpful in the context of understanding the love of God and, and, and Christ for us. Um, but um, uh, I have used one of, well, I've used many of Brennan's quotes, but one I've used literally dozens of times is one that I quoted last week, uh, which is that you, you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grace you accept. I, I have... I have believed that, I've, I've preached that, I've taught that, I've written it more times than I can imagine. And yet when I was cutting and pasting last week for the message um, that I, I brought to you about uh, moments that matter, uh, for some reason I cut and pasted one that had a spelling mistake, which I told you a little bit about last week. So what I read was not, you, you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grace you accept. But what I read and what I pasted was you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave you accept. Uh, and I must admit, it intrigued me. It was one of those, what I call divine accidents. Uh, that I just found the notes that had it on that was wrong, because I was meant to see it wrong and not see it right, because there was something important about understanding that you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave that you accept. There is an importance in our lives to how we contextualize the whole subject of death. Um, let me give you one of the scripture, and then I'll talk about that a little bit more extensively. Genesis 8, verse 22. Um, this is what God said to Noah, or what's written that God had said to Noah after the flood. Now, um, some people have some weird ideas about God. You know, God was very gracious. He said, I'll never flood the earth again. So how can it make sense that God says, no, I've got a better idea. I'll destroy it by fire and I'll burn everybody to death. You've got to think some of these things through, folks, because, you know, you just have. So anyway, he said this, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So there is, there is, there is a, a revelation of a pattern that is extremely important to the living of life in the way that you ascend up the helix rather than descend down the helix, in a way that you can handle that life is a corkscrew that can't be straightened. So what we have is, is complementary uh, yet contrasting events. Summer, winter... Cold, heat, day, night, seed time, harvest. Here's the point. Death is an important part of life. If you don't embrace that and grasp that, the problem is you will be dragging around with you things that actually are death that you should have got rid of a long time ago. 
And so, back to Manning's statement, you'll not be measured by the good you do, but by the grave you accept. Every one of us needs to have a grave into which we put things that are dead. Okay, now let me explain a little bit more. Death is an important part of life. If you do not embrace it, it will devour you. Now, I'm not just talking about, you know, when you stop breathing and your heart stops beating and you close your eyes. How many of you know death is much more than that? In fact, that, that's the least death that you need to be worried about. Sincerely. I think within that death there is a grace and in that grace there is a kindness and whatever it is that God does in that thing he has taken care of through Christ on the cross. I'm more concerned about the death that we have in our life. The decay that occurs within us, in our thinking, in our actions, in our attitude, in our relationships, in our understanding, in our expectations. Death is an important part of life. If you don't embrace it, it will devour you. And if you're struggling today, it's because death is devouring you. You say, no, it's not death, it's, it's this relationship. It's not death, it's that disappointment. But they are the death in our lives. They're killing something within us. Something's dying because of them. Death. Also, seasons, remember we talked about seed time harvest, seasons are an important part of fruitfulness. So death is an important part of life, and seasons are an important part of fruitfulness. If you do not cooperate, they will destroy you. You have to cooperate in the natural world with the seasons. Otherwise, the seasons will destroy you. In the spiritual life, in your personal life, if you don't cooperate with the seasons, the seasons will destroy you. Now, we are guaranteed that there'll be summer, there'll be winter, there'll be heat, there'll be cold. All of these things we are guaranteed in the context of seasons that will never change. And if you don't recognize in your life that you go through seasons then you'll be trying to work against the season when actually the season is working for you if you will embrace the season. You can't change the season. You can't dictate the season. You can't suddenly decide, I've decided today it's going to be summer in my life if it's a winter time in your life. You can't decide this is going to be a really warm, fuzzy period if it's going to be a cold, freezing period. You cannot decide those things yourself. You can't decide it's going to be a day if it's going to be a night. I have no control over day and night, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. And as one dear old English legend King, King Canute, discovered when he decided he wasn't going to let the sea come in, he wasn't going to let the tide go past him, he was going to tell the tide, in the name of the king, you can't go any further, and he got what was coming to him. So I'm trying to show you that in life is a corkscrew, you can't straighten it. Seasons happen in our life, and some of those seasons are dark, some of them, are, they are dark, cold, and seem to be very unproductive, but they are still seasons. If we work with the season, then the season will not destroy us, okay? So, death is an important part of life. If you don't embrace it, it will devour you. Seasons are an important part of fruitfulness. If you do not cooperate, they will destroy you. Resurrection is a promise. It's something you participate in, not that you create. Jesus said one day to a woman who was struggling because her brother had died, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of resurrection. Religion has turned it into a gospel of death. So it's made death the powerful thing. Death is not the powerful thing. It was interesting, this is not critical, but I thought it was interesting that someone suggested that in our Uh, redeeming Halloween for people who've influenced our life who are now dead that we should have Jesus up there Jesus is not dead the whole point is he is alive the gospel for the first 400 years was not Jesus died for your sins it's Jesus rose to bring you back to life 
And so you can look historically that the early gospel was not focused on the death of Jesus, though that was important, and the death of Jesus was establishing God's covenant promise to himself that he would never break, that he would bring us into relationship with himself, not by anything we had done, but by what he had done for us. The important part was Jesus rose from the dead. I've told you before, some have not heard this. There were dozens of so-called messiahs in the history of the nation of Israel. There were at least 30 messiahs around during the lifetime of Jesus who claimed to be the messiah. And most of those messiahs finished up either being killed in battle because they were violent, unlike the peaceful Jesus, or they were crucified for saying that they were the messiah. So a crucified messiah was not news. They had had them, they had them, and they would have them. But a Messiah who rose from the dead, one who had the power to defeat the grave and break the power of death and come alive again when you knew that he was dead, when you knew that he'd been through the darkest of seasons and the coldest of nights, for him to come alive was the message of the gospel. So yes, we have to understand that death is an important part of life. If you don't embrace it, it will devour you. Seasons are an important part of fruitfulness. If you don't cooperate, they will destroy you. But resurrection is a promise. And it's something you participate in, not that you create. You see, the whole thing that God was trying to display for us to understand is that in these seasons, there is a a death and there is a life. And it's the seasons and death and life are all interconnected. And so, why would we not think that in our lives, death and seasons go together, but it's not the death that is the death of death, but it's death that actually, if we will understand it, is part of the process that brings us to resurrection life. So we watch the trees now lose their leaves. Why? Because we talk about them dying for winter. The stuff's dying back for winter. But it's not an eternal death. It's actually something that is embraced within nature because you are not, you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave you accept. And so those plants have to accept there is a time for the grave. There's a time for some things to die. There's a time for things that you carried, things that you were, things that you thought, things that were happening. There's a time for it to die. But if you try to not let it die, you actually will kill the tree eternally Because all its energies are being then diluted to try and preserve something that's supposed to die. And some of you are in the risk of of a kind of eternal death because you're trying to put life into something that's supposed to die. Learn not to be afraid of those deaths that come through seasons. Because they are not deaths that destroy us, they are deaths that bring us to life. I would even say that what I said about the rock, changing the rock to Q Church is because there comes a time when you don't fight that, you don't try and keep that alive, you understand it has had a season. We thank God for the season. We thank God for the fruitfulness. But death is not something to be feared because death is part of life. And seasons are not something to be feared because seasons are part of fruitfulness and resurrection is connected to those things. So in a few months' time, we'll start to see the trees bud and that that had no leaves that looked stark and desperate and cold and empty and nothing will start to bud and come into life and something will start to emerge. Everything will burst into life because of resurrection. This is what God is trying to get through to you, that we are in the same process. We're in the corkscrew of life. But if we understand that that there are deaths that are helping us, there are seasons that are important, and that resurrection is a promise, our lives begin to change because we're now living in the resurrection life that is what Christ came to bring us into. So, many ancient religions embraced this God-created reality and understood that cooperating with the seasons and embracing death as a part of life produced certain things. We have missed a trick... Very often in the Christian faith, because we got, got afraid of paganism and, 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 and all these other religions that I, I do not buy into, I do not uh, attain to, I do not accept that there is validity in all of them, 
But I need you to know that we let them steal some truths and because they got those truths, we then decided we couldn't embrace those because now the pagans accepted them or whatever. The pagans have a better understanding of the cycle of the corkscrew and life and death and the earth than most Christians have and it's time we redeemed that back and said, hang on a minute, this is not a pagan idea, this is a God idea, this is a creation idea and we're not afraid of these things because we understand how they work in the regeneration of life and that God is at the centre of all of these things. God the Abba of Jesus. What they understood in embracing these things and we need to understand it tonight is that life... Death as part of life and cooperating with the seasons produce certain things. These are three things it produces. Longevity. So longevity in nature comes because it works with the seasons and it embraces death. See, if you don't embrace the season you're in, if you don't work with the season and embrace some of the death that's coming so that it brings change to you and your attitude and your thinking and your approach and your understanding then what will happen is you will not have longevity. Your relationship will fail. Your faith will fail. Your pilgrimage will fail. Your hope will fail. Your heart will fail. Because for these things, when you embrace them through all those seasons, when you work with the seasons and embrace the death as part of it, but understand resurrection, it brings longevity. I'm still standing. I'm still here. I walked through more horrors in the last 14 years than in the previous 40 odd. But I'm still standing. Because in those seasons and through those deaths has come a wonderful life. That I now say, would I choose to go that way? The answer is no. But am I thankful that I have gone that way? The answer is yes. Because those seasons and those deaths have produced something. And it was only last week when I understood this principle that I'm not just measured by the good I do, or I won't be measured by the good I do, but by the grave I accept. I have been touched by grace, but I also accepted a grave into which has gone, like room 101, the junk and the stuff and the bits of life and the bits of attitude and the bits of doubt and unbelief and ridiculous behavior have gone into that grave. I maintain that grave. And nothing's coming out of there because I live in the resurrection of Jesus, Okay. So, so, so it produces longevity. Uh, cooperating with the season, embracing death as part of life produces strength. You become a stronger person because you've gone through the seasons. You've endured, you've come through. It leaves you with the strength to carry on. Another song there, isn't there? Um, and the third thing it gives you when you cooperate with the seasons and embrace death as part of life is fruitfulness. Unless your apple tree cooperates with the season and embraces the death, you ain't getting no fruit next year. It has to cooperate with the seasons and embrace the death because fruitfulness is connected to that. So in this, instead of trying to straighten the corkscrew, learn by the grace of God how to go through the seasons, how to embrace that death is part of life, but understand that is not the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection. And when resurrection comes, fruitfulness also comes. So, um, in summer... Heat, light, you grow. In winter, cold, dark, you grow. You've got to understand this. In the summer, with heat, light, with summer, with heat and light, you grow up. But in winter, with cold and dark, you grow down. So you thought nothing was happening in nature when the dark nights come and the winter starts and the cold weather begins. But all that happened is the energy, instead of being used to grow up, has been used to grow down. And the truth is, the lower you go, the higher you grow. And some of you are not growing any higher because you haven't gone any lower. You've lost the understanding that it's the roots of your life that determine the fruits of your life, 
And that in seasons when it's dark and tough, you have to put the energy into the roots. What do I really believe? How much do I really believe this? What will I sacrifice because of what I believe? How much will I continue to confess that God is with me and he's got his hand upon me and God is with me for good and he will not forsake me and I can't be separated from the love of God and greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world and Christ is in me the hope of glory so there can only be one outcome which is resurrection. The lower you go, the higher you grow. See, your tough times are not wasted times. Your tough times are the valuable times and sometimes we don't come out of the tough times because we're not doing what you should do when you're in the tough time. Grow your roots. Grow your roots. One of the worst things I've watched people happen is, oh, it was terrible, it was so bad, I couldn't come to church. Now, I don't think the be-all and end-all of everything is church. It used to be... And, uh, you know, I've done, I've done church and would do. I'm very committed. I, I believe in gathering together. But one of the worst things you can do when you're low is stay away from the place where your roots can get fed so that you can grow high. And we make that mistake of saying, because I feel tired, because I feel weak, because I feel this, because there's all these pressures, if you stay away from what feeds the roots, then guess what? Your roots are not going to grow any bigger, so you can't grow any taller. So we stay weak. Okay, listen to this. Stability is not fruit related. It's root related. You can grow as much fruit as you like on your tree, but you're not going to make it one iota more stable. Stability doesn't come from the fruit. Stability comes from the root. So if you want to be stable, it's not about how many good things can happen and how much fruit can we have. It's about how, big, how deep can you grow your roots? How much are you willing to put your roots into what the kingdom of God is all about, what your heavenly Father desires for you? Because that's where stability is. And when you have that stability, you can be fruitful. And there's parables about that, like the man who built his house on the sand and the man who built his house on the rock, which is all to do with root and foundation being the important thing in the context of growing something that actually lasts. So, nearly done. What we need to be growing is growing in strength in the three things that truly matter. Faith, hope and love. Now these three remain. Faith, hope and love. You get your focus on growing in these things that matter. Faith, hope and love. That's where the root is. That's where the root is. Get those roots, you'll grow high. And when you grow high, you'll grow fruit. Okay? So, nearly done. Ecclesiastes 3, again, our man who was not the most positively optimistic frame of mind at the time, but was right on some things, and this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. And he talks about a time to live, a time to die, a time to this, that, and the other. It's quite a reasonably well-known scripture, but there's a time and a season for everything and every activity under heaven. Stop fighting the time and the season. The main reason you do it is because you've still got the fear of death in you. But Jesus came to free all those who were all their lifetime in bondage through their fear of death. Because it's the fear of death that makes us react rather than respond. We react to the circumstance rather than respond to the truth. Jesus didn't react to the terror of dying on the cross. He responded to the truth that his father had promised him that he would raise him from the dead. And we turn from reacting to responding, from reacting to the situation to responding to the truth that is in us because we grow some roots. So, so there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. For those of you going through tough stuff right now, let me just encourage you if you will embrace that death is part of this process, and if you will work with the season, there's only one possible outcome, and that outcome is resurrection. Life from the dead, new buds, new growth, new beginning, because in your dark time now, what you're saying is, I'm going to focus, my roots are going to grow in this situation, because that's not the end, the fruit is coming. Because night turns to day, and winter turns to summer, cold turns to heat, and we turn to harvest. 
So let me finish by saying this. It's what we do in the seasons of our lives that determines what we get from the seasons of our lives. Did you catch that? It's what we do in the seasons of our lives that determines what we get from the seasons of our lives. I want you to make a decision tonight what you're going to do with this season. Number one, you will not fear death. Even though death is part of what you're going through. That you will embrace the season because you can't straighten the corkscrew. But you'll do it in faith, hope and love that the God who cares about you is with you and he's going to bring you through to a resurrection. So here's my three words of advice to you. Be tenacious... That means know the truth and hold on to it as if your life depended on it because it probably does. Be tenacious. Right? Be tenacious. Know the truth and hold on to it as if your life depended upon it in times of difficulty. Be brave about facing and dealing with the unknown and the lack of certitude as to the outcome. One of the reasons we're not brave is because we fe- our greatest fear is fear of the unknown. That's why most people fear physical death because it's fear of the unknown. You know, why many people with faith lose that fear because they don't see it as an unknown quantity. But all death does that and fear is always the result of our, uh, our dealing with the unknown and lack of certitude as to the outcome. I can't be certain how this will turn out. No, but you have a promise. You have a promise that life comes from the dead. You have a promise that resurrection is in you. You have a promise that through all the seasons, life is what it comes to. It's producing life and not death. Be brave. Be tenacious. And the third thing, be honest. I'm not expecting you. The church is not expecting you. God is not expecting you. We are not expecting you to avoid the truth. To pretend that the truth is not the truth. Be honest, don't avoid the truth, even if it's painful, okay? Don't avoid the truth. The truth is, in seasons when it's dark and cold, stuff happens. The corkscrew can't be straightened. That's the truth, but the truth is also the greater truth, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus helps us get up that corkscrew, and we can do it if we learn these principles of embracing the process of death as part of life and understanding the seasons. Okay, and here's the last one of those. Live with integrity. Very important. Integrity is not just, you know, being good to your kids and going and getting a job. Integrity is is connected to the word integrate, which means that every part of our lives should be one. We don't have a life here and a life away from here and a life at home with the family and a life at work integrated we integrate our life we are one person living one life one spirit one soul one body with one faith one doctrine one baptism integrated that's what a life of integrity is that it's all together so we know that we take God with us and God goes with us into every situation we go because we have an integrated life we have integrity live with integrity God is with you and Christ is in you And if you live this way in the seasons, you will be blessed and fruitfulness will come and life will come from the dead. They all didn't expect it. Even those Jesus had told them and told them and told them, like I think, I tell you and tell you and tell you. And Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead. Son of man will rise from the dead after three days. So they all go to the tomb ready to anoint his body because they think he's still going to be there. Because if you don't expect he's going to be there, you don't take spices to anoint the body. They were shocked because they weren't listening. They didn't, they didn't understand. They didn't believe. But then they met an angel. And the angel said, he is not here, but he is risen. You're looking in the wrong place. Don't dwell here. This is not the place to be. Keep the grave for all the stuff that needs to go and leave it in the grave because you won't be measured by the good you do but by the grave you accept. Let those things stay in the grave but understand that the Christ who is in you is not in the grave. He is risen. He's alive in you. He's alive for you. And life is what will come if you understand these principles. So my last statement is this which was a clever proverb not in the Bible but probably should be Blessed are the flexible for they will not be bent out of shape. So, Father, these precious people that we gather here together, you, you, you alone know some of the intricacies and the pains and the frustrations and the, 
disappointments and the disillusionments and the heartaches and the joys and the, and the victories and the, the wonders. Uh, but you said you'd never leave us or forsake us. So I particularly am asking you tonight, Father, for all of those who are in these cold, dark winter seasons trying to straighten the corkscrew, just wearing themselves out, tiring themselves, getting depressed and disillusioned and sad and weak. I pray today, Father, for a release. I pray right now that for a decision that says that I have to accept a grave. There is a grave that I need to accept by which I'll be measured. And into that now, I'm going to put all those silly efforts that I am trying to express to not accept that death is part of life, to not work with the seasons which are part of fruitfulness, and to not allow resurrection to burst through. Put it in the grave tonight. Put it in the grave. Say, that's it. I can't straighten the corkscrew. I'm going to stop trying. I'm going to relax under God because God loves me and he's going to help me. And I embrace this season is a season for growing my roots down so I can grow my life up. And to know that as my life grows up, I'll be incredibly fruitful. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Make a commitment in your heart tonight. Jesus, help me to have that flexibility to put these truths into practice for your resurrection power to work in you, in me, and your grace to release me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.